I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight, straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah from the 23rd verse of the first chapter of the gospel according to St. John. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. First thing that stands out about this message we have today before us is that John the Baptist cried, it says, cried, cried out, cried aloud. Um, he said he was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 40, that he was a voice crying in the wilderness. And Isaiah says in verse 9, O Zion, that, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. There was no shyness at all. We are sure about John the Baptist. And he had a heavy sounding voice and a heavy message. And they went well together. And so he says, I am sent to cry in the wilderness with strength and lifting up my voice. I'm not afraid to deliver this message. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, said the prophet Isaiah. And John goes on in Luke, described a little more thoroughly. The axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. He's not mincing words. He's saying the judgment is coming. It is time yet to repent, to be baptized into his baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins with a vow to amend one's ways. And he had many followers, including even some Roman soldiers, you'll remember. The soldiers asked him, what should we do? And they had to have been Gentiles. A lot of people came to hear John. And he said, I am not the Christ. But he said, there cometh one after me. I preach. I preach repentance and baptism to amend your ways. But the one that comes after me will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, as the Apostle Luke describes it. John says, in effect, I preach. The one that comes after me will execute the things that I am preaching about. He will cut down the barren tree that bears no fruit. And he will make a difference between the grain of wheat and the chaff. And when he makes that difference, he will burn the chaff with fire unquenchable. This is a heavy sounding material. This is the God who, if he is merciful to us, he has a very unmerciful message to those that are not with him. It's a fearful and awesome thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yes, he is the shelter of those who believe in him. But outside that shelter, all is judgment and fire and no mercy at all. And in spite of knowing all this, knowing it, Christians go along easy in their minds. All good talk, all good intentions, fundamentally unmoved. Jesus came into the world to give his life for us. He came into the world to sacrifice human nature. Think about it. Think about it. Human flesh rebelled against God. It put the flesh above the spirit. God said, you will surely die. And that sentence has to be carried out. And he meant die. The punishment for that usurpation of flesh over spirit. And none of us could stand it 
if it fell upon us. And the miracle is that God the Son himself took upon himself mortal flesh so that, essentially, he could bear the penalty as a mortal flesh-bearing human being. One of those on whom the destructive penalty falls. It's right that it should fall on all flesh. And he says, here, take me. I'm human flesh. I'm mortal. And he stands in the gap. And he takes all of it for you and me. Because we couldn't survive. It killed him. And with him, all human nature in virtue, in the eyes, in the mind, in the sight of God, is destroyed in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why over and over again, the apostles and the evangelists say, I am crucified with Christ. Human nature is destroyed in his death and with him. But if we are with him in his death, we will be with him in his resurrection also. But there is no mercy to those that are outside of it. None. Why? Why is human nature destroyed? Because of the offense that we mentioned. But also because when that first offense took place, the whole of human nature was polluted. It sank into a state of death, mortality. And it became friends with all the evils in the world, sins. Prophet Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Good verse to remember. It should come back to us often. Human nature has a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So much so, we can't even realize the extent of it. Who can know it? So he said, and Jesus Christ agrees. Here's what he said in Matthew. Those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. They defile a man. For out of the heart proceedeth, proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These things defile a man. That's Matthew 15, verses 18 to 20. And he said a little more extensively, like it, something like it in Mark 7, verses 20 to 23. That which cometh out of the man defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile the man. Isn't that some certification, some commentary on us? Human nature? Listen to it. Wow. That doesn't sound very flattering. No wonder humanity had to be put down. Human flesh had to be put down. These are some of its fruits, and there are only some of them. Paul said in Romans seven eighteen, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul said again in Romans 8, 6 to 8, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, note this carefully, Romans 8, verse 7, The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. James says, do you think the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? James 4, 5. 
Listen to Paul again in Galatians 5, 17 to 21. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, I don't do such things. You have a nature that does, and you're tempted to this, and you've trodden the borders of this at times, and you know that even to look at it and consider it is a sin, it's a violation. We're all guilty. Now, what St. Paul enumerated there in Galatians 5 sounds very much like what Jesus enumerated in Matthew and Mark, and very much like what the prophet Jeremiah said, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. These are all in unison, my friends, all in unison, that the human race is defiled and is not reformable, cannot be made subject to the law of God. It must be destroyed. And if we don't get that into our heads, we won't understand any more about our Christian obligations. That's the reason Jesus came into the world, after all. He said, I came here to die, to ransom you from the penalty of your sins. That's what I'm here for, to be destroyed, to take that sentence of destruction that rightly pertains to all human flesh. This, if anything, this voice, this unified voice from the Old Testament and the New and from Christ himself deconstructs all the hopes that we have for ourselves that we can get ahead somehow in this life. We can make it. It deconstructs all of it. You cannot. You are in a body of sin. You must abandon this body of sin. Jesus himself said so. Luke 9, 23. Listen to what he says we have to do. He's already committed to die. Here's what he says we have to do. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, every day, and follow me. Luke 9, 23 and 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, shall lose it. Do you have some hopes for your life now? You're going to try to save it somehow? Do something with it? I say that's all been deconstructed by what Jesus himself has told us and Paul and Jeremiah and the others about what our nature is like. Deconstruct all those hopes for yourself. He would save his life shall lose it. But whoever whosoever will lose his life for my sake, shall find it. Luke 14, in verses 26, 27, and 33, listen to these verses. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That means if you don't have a lower regard for all those things, than you have for Jesus. That's what hate means. You essentially are willing to part with them rather than with him if it comes to a choice. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you have to sit here and detest them all. No, it means you have to give them a lower priority than you give to Jesus Christ. And that goes for your own skin. A lower priority than you give to Jesus Christ. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That is, whoever isn't walking the road of Calvary to Calvary, 
to crucifixion and death to the end of all your hopes for your own self in this life whoever isn't walking that path path with me doing what I'm doing taking the human nature that we're born with and putting it to the cross whoever isn't doing that daily cannot be my disciple so likewise whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath he cannot be my disciple that's it pure and simple Christ died for us he asks us to follow him in that death put everything and everybody else in life including our own heart's desires beneath our obligation to put our life on the line for him you say that's a tall order I don't know how I can do that well if you stick with Jesus you can if you stay with him you can just put him in your mind and you previously had a picture of something tempting that you want you say we're, we're, we're walking down a road and that road is called the road of destruction it leads to, to destruction we shouldn't be walking down that road going across that road or maybe even in the opposite direction from it is another road and that's called the hill of Calvary and Jesus is on that road bleeding and dying for you and for me and every time you're tempted to walk on the road in which you were born and try and accommodate things together and say I can be a Christian and still walk this road on which I was born you can't do it it's like walking towards a, a, a cliff or a place where there used to be a bridge there's no bridge anymore it's just a big chasm that's what we're doing when we're walking the road of the flesh walking a road that ends in a sudden destruction you can do it for a little while but it leads to destruction why not just instead of walking down that road look over this other road where Jesus is walking to Calvary and say I can't I can't look both places at once my some you know like a cow has an eye on one side and an eye on the other side you can see two things at once you and I can't do that you can't move one eye over the path that walks the flesh and the other eye over to the path that is the road to Calvary you got to look at one or the other when you look at one Calvary you're looking away from the other and if you start to walk the road to Calvary you're walking away on the, away from the other road this is your way to put down and mortify the flesh you don't have to spend your time thinking of ways of mortifying the flesh put Jesus in your picture in your eye mind's eye crucified if I be lifted up I will draw all men unto me Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so that whoever looked at it was healed and saved alive he likened himself to that put, put the picture of Jesus Christ crucified in your sight and your eyes will leave everything else and that's the answer to every temptation this is how we deny self we abandon forsake self by attaching to Jesus to looking at him looking at away from everything that tempts us looking to him every sin and temptation that comes along change the picture put Christ crucified in front of your eyes and the devil will flee and you'll be in safe hands you know the advice the apostle gives us sounds like two different kinds in a way it says mortify the deeds of the body and you shall live but it also says reckon yourselves this is Romans 6 11 reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God and some people say well I'm having a hard time you know th imagining that I you know mortifying myself you know because I'm still alive and, and I'm trying very hard to mortify myself but at the same time I'm, I'm, I'm still here I'm still alive and I can't quite put it together there used to be an evangelist who was a Chinaman he was his name was uh, Watchman Nee he was a very excellent evangelist I don't know if anybody ever heard of him 50 years ago his name was common I haven't heard it for years 
But he wrote a few books. And one of those books was called The Normal Christian Life. I can remember at the recommendation of another evangelical believer, I picked up that book and read it. And he says, people stumble over this, how to look away from our sinful selves and look at Jesus. He says, look at Romans 6.11, reckon yourselves also to be dead. Do you know what reckon means? Count on it as a fact. That's what we do when we reckon. We reckon up numbers, we reckon facts to be such. We identify it as a done deed, a fact. It's not something you have to try to imagine and bring into existence. It's there. Colossians 3.3 3. Ye are dead. Ye are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. The only life you have is with Christ. You don't have this life that's on this road to destruction. It only appears like you do. You don't even have that choice because it leads to destruction. If you don't believe it, you can go experience it, but that'll be too late. That road is already closed off. You're already dead to it. Why live in the things that you, God has already made you dead to? That's what the apostle is saying. And Watchman Nee said, you don't even have to try. Just believe it as a fact. You are dead. I am crucified with Christ, said Paul. You know, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. All of Jesus Christ's miracles were based on the same principle. He raised people who were dead from the dead, from their deadness, from their death, from their totally dead condition. How can a dead person say, oh, I'll be all right, I'm, somehow I'm going to get through it. He can't think anything. He can't even think, I wish that I could be raised from the dead. He's dead. And Christ comes along and raises him from the dead. And so it was with the sick of the palsy. He couldn't stir hand or foot. He had to have four friends carrying his litter to bring him to Christ to be healed. He couldn't move. This is the condition we're in when we're bound up with our pride, and our self-sufficiency, our self-satisfaction, our self-approval, our self-congratulation. We can't move hand or foot. We're dead. We don't have to. You could. You don't have to reckon to be so. It is a fact. You are dead, and that's the kind of thing Christ can do. Remember when, he, when Lazarus was dying? Everybody said, you better get there in time. He's going to die. He's, he's in a serious illness. And Jesus tarried, and he tarried, and he tarried. And they said, oh, it's too late now. He's dead. He said, I know that Lazarus is dead. Don't you believe in me? God isn't in a hurry to catch you or me before it's too late. He can pick us up after we've fallen. He can raise us when we're dead in trespasses and sins. But if we tempt him, we're wasting that opportunity too, and there's no recovery from that. None. So we're like a branch that's broken off of the vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches, said Jesus in God, John's Gospel. Can a branch lying on the ground separate from the vine bear fruit, bear grapes? Do you think so? Neither can any person who is apart from Christ do any good thing. Deconstruct that hope. How much more do the prophets and Christ himself have to say about the deceitfulness and the wickedness of human nature? No effort of ours can make us live and make us bear fruit. It's not our efforts. 
in one of his recent devotions, Bishop Ogles put it this way, we are nothing more than dust without the Lord. And he was, it was commentary on one of our Advent hymns. Without thy grace we waste away like flowers that wither and decay. We have no help but in him. None. Willpower, good intentions, good hopes, they're all destroyed, useless, worthless. We have Jesus Christ, then we have the only power that can raise, the only power that can mortify our, our wicked ways, the only power that can create goodness in us. The only power that can pick up the branch that was broken off and grafted into the living tree, the living vine. The only one is Jesus. The only thing for us to do with human nature and with our sinful nature is not to find a way to excuse it or justify it or make room for it or compromise it or see if it can fit in or see if you can postpone fixing it. Abandon it. Walk away from it. Put Jesus Christ on the cross in front of your eyes. That will be the fix for it. There is no other remedy. There's nothing left. There's no choice left. That's why he told his apostles and prophets to tear down. He didn't want to leave anything left for us. He told Jeremiah, I've set thee this day over the nations and the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, destroy, throw down, and to build and to plant. And Apostle Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Is the human heart not such a stronghold? It is. It's a fortress against God. Pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations. Are we full of imaginations about all the hopes we have for ourselves in this life? Forget it. All that goes to the cross. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. These words are, are pretty final as far as our human nature goes. There's no hope for it. We're to abandon it, we're to turn our backs on it, we're to look away and look at Christ, our Redeemer, on the cross. And if we can't think of anything else, think only of Christ crucified, only. And he will carry you. When you see him, then the Spirit will show you Jesus Christ doing right where you and I do wrong. He'll show you Jesus Christ carrying to completion all right ways, all good and perfect ways, all, all the good things and the right things that we imagine ourselves capable of doing but aren't. You'll see Jesus Christ performing that. And when you do, if you have him in your heart, you know that he's going to perform the same things in you. And there's your hope. There is our hope. To be saved by him from all temptations. If you love me, keep my commandments, he said. If you love me. He didn't say, do it. He said, if you love me, do it. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Amazing. He changes the whole Old Testament from do it or die to if you love me, follow me. And he'll give you the Spirit. The Spirit makes you able to follow. The Spirit, in fact, plants in our hearts the capacity to love him. The Spirit, in fact, plants Jesus there. And when St. Paul says, put on the new man, Jesus is that new man. And by looking at him crucified, you are seeing and putting into your mind's eye and your heart Jesus Christ, the new man, replacing the old, dying as we are to die to self. He dies for us. 
to rise again to perfect righteousness. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And he died once, he died unto sin. But if he lives, he lives to everlasting life. And so will it be with everyone that is in him and through him has put down self, abandoned self, and allowed the Spirit to make, to bring forth in us his new creation. We can't, nobody can be born again by his own will. Nobody can be born by his own will. As St. James put it, by his own will begat he us with the word of truth. And he, as St. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, he that began a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. This is Christ, the new man within, being the new creature, making us his new creature, and doing all these things in us by his power. Not saying, do this, when you get the trick right, you can do it too. No. It's Jesus replacing us, being that new self within us, that spirit that does all the right things. That's the new creature. The new creature is not of our making. It's Jesus Christ living in our hearts, in our place, in our place. There's that hymn, I've quoted it before, it's an old gospel favorite, and it says, I want a godly fear, a quick discerning eye that looks to thee, my God, and sees the tempter fly. Isn't that what I've been saying? Look to him. And while you're looking to him, the devil can't stand it. There's no place for him. You have no eye for him, no heart for him. He flees. He's afraid of the cross. You know that? Satan is ghastly afraid of the cross of Christ. It scares him. He has no answer to it. And that's why the angels in heaven had victory over the devil and his angels because they pleaded the blood of Christ. It says so in Revelation. They overcame him by the word, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And when you take the cross of Christ in your mind's eye, you have that weapon that destroys the devil and all his works. He has no further claim on you. He can't stand it. It's God, the new, career, the new man within, who brings this prayer true that we pray. He's the one who gives us a godly fear. It is God within who gives us that quick discerning eye. It is Christ's eye that's doing the looking for us draws our eyes to God and when we see, look at him we can see the tempter fly dear God our father awaken us to thy presence in our hearts and to thy great love for us shown by thy sons dying for us teach us to trust only and totally in thy leading at all times, drive far away from us all wrong thinking, all self-justification, all self-righteousness, all self-satisfaction, all self-excusing, all self-congratulation, all self-approval, all self-confidence, all self-esteem. Transfer all of this to thee, all of it. Let us always seek thy will and thy pleasure, thy person, thy crucified self within us, so that we may instantly follow thee without question, so that at thy coming again to judge the quick and the dead and all the world, we may instantly rise to thee, without hesitation, with true faith, love, worship, thanks, and praise 
for thy unspeakable gift. For in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.